It is not easy being a mainstream American Muslim these days. The specter of radicalism hangs in the public mind. And even the most assimilated of believers, those born here or immigrants who now claim America as their own, face skepticism wherever they turn. Here's our account of how one increasingly prominent figure in the community copes with the skepticism and the scrutiny. His name is Zaid Shakir. On a recent Saturday at a mosque in Brooklyn, New York, hundreds of Muslims gathered to hear one of the rising stars in their faith. I, many people act like this is the worst the Muslims have ever experienced. You know, in America, it's like, I can't take it anymore. Can't take what? People looking at me like that. <laughs> you know that look? It's like, man, people's homes being blown up. And you're worried about that look? I tell you, you know how you diffuse that? Just wave. <laughs> Seriously, that's why I just wave and blow <laughs> Then start running towards him in slow motion. <laughs> Boom, that look will go away real fast. <laughs> Imam Zaid Shakir is one of the most popular Muslim teachers in America today. We all came from somewhere to this room today. Probably five years ago, a good percentage of us wouldn't be at a similar gathering, this type of gathering. We all have our histories. And for many of us, it was a very involved search. Now, would you like to go back to that confused state that Allah rescued you from? I don't think many would. Remember where you came from and remember where you're trying to go. I first met Zaid Shakir five years ago when I interviewed him soon after September 11th and the country was scrambling to learn all we could about Islam. His home is here in California. He's a scholar in residence at the Zaytuna Institute, a Muslim graduate school for students from across the country. The graduate program is still in its infancy with a handful of full-time seminary students and general classes attended by several hundred. Most imams working in America are foreign-born, enlisted by American mosques to tutor the growing Muslim population in this country. For most of them, America is a wholly new experience, but not Imam Shakir. He was born Ricky Mitchell, raised by a single mom in a Baptist family in inner-city housing projects. On this expedition toward Islam, were you looking back over your shoulder at that experience in the segregated projects? Uh, not really. More looking ahead. And in a sense, let me, let me rephrase that. I, I think, now that I think about it, yes. Because a lot of the problems there, social problems there, I was seeking an answer for. So the broken homes, the alcoholism, the drug abuse. One of the most powerful experiences for me during that time, uh, I was actually at a party. And another project, this project is called Mount Pleasant, which in New Britain was probably the, the hardest one. And there was the roughest, a, the roughest. The roughest, the roughest. And I was leaving, and there it was really cold. This was pre-global warming Connecticut, so it was real cold. And uh, a young, probably 10-year-old, little Puerto Rican girl, she ran out of her house screaming in the middle of the night in the cold, why doesn't anyone love me? Why doesn't anyone love me? And that really affected me. And I said, you know, there has to be something we can do to avoid a child reaching this point at 10 years old. So that really, really affected me. You say in your book, Scattered Pictures, that you once held a bitter contempt for the land of your birth, for America. Absolutely. Why was that? Just growing up as a so-called ethnic minority in, a, in America and seeing how systematically people are placed in, in a context that does not encourage their success, that tends to make you bitter. Seeing people gunned down 
by the police and there's no, not even an investigation into why they were shot. That makes people bitter. And uh, I think it's a grace of God to be able to transcend that. And I'm, I'm sure some of that, uh, some vestiges of that are still in me. I mean, we, we are a product of our past and our histories. What did you do with that bitterness? I had to learn to con- come to grips with it and channel it in constructive uh, ways. I never t- challenged it in destructive ways. I don't have a criminal record. You'd grown up with your mother raising you and what, six other? Six other children. Six other children. Tell me about your mother because you refer to her often in your book. I, I think she was a very deep and strong lady. Uh, she was an epileptic, which we didn't know at the time. She hid it from us. And all of her seizures uh, were nocturnal. So we never saw it. We would see the effects of it in the morning, and she would just dismiss it. Oh, I had a bad night. I couldn't sleep. Insomnia. So we didn't know this battle she was waging. She sacrificed, and she focused on us. And I think she, she just was the epitome of the strong black mother who gave her all to her children. His mother was also a writer, and Shakir and his six brothers and sisters have just published her memoir. She was extremely intelligent. She probably, under other circumstances, would have had a brilliant college career and could have been any number of things in this society. So uh, that's where it came from, just intellect, uh, a love for reading, and uh, a very rich and wide uh, literary base, what and a hard life. And a hard life. What do you think she would think of what you're doing now? Uh, I, I would hope that she would view, view it favorably. As a young man, Shakir moved away from Christianity and tried on various worldviews and theologies. Nothing stuck. Then, in 1975, after his mother's death, he dropped out of community college and joined the Air Force. There, in uniform, he found Islam. You moved out of the Baptist frame, and you tried transcendental meditation, you tried communism, you tried uh, uh, a lot of things, and finally something happened that, 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 uh, that attracted you to Islam. What was it? I think a lot of uh, elements in various systems and theologies that I studied before Islam and found them lacking for one reason or another, Islam addressed all of them, all of those issues, and brought them all together. So it had the... So help me to understand that. What was it? uh, So I'll give you an example. It had the spirituality of transcendental meditation through what we call dhikr and Quran recitation, things that are very soothing to the soul, but it also had a social activism component that transcendental meditation didn't have. It had the social activism of the communists with God. So a lot of things that were absent in those things I studied before Islam were present in Islam, and they were brought together in a very integrated way that led me to believe personally that this is from God. Was there, there wasn't a moment, a aha moment, you know, Paul on his horse, knocked no, off his horse no, by the blinding light? Uh, no, I wasn't on the road to Hartford, <laughs> not at all. It was definitely just exploration and inquiry, and that led to a certain conclusion. The scholarly life appealed to him. He graduated with honors from American University, he got a master's in political science from Rutgers, and went on to study at some of the most prestigious Islamic schools in the Middle East. He now lives with his wife and teenage son in Oakland, California, near the Zatuna Institute. He met Salia when both were in the Air Force. They studied the faith together. After morning prayers at 6 a.m., Shakir drives his son Saeed to school using the time to remind him to keep the faith. He's a Muslim, and uh, he, he would describe himself as his own Muslim. He doesn't smoke, he doesn't drink, he doesn't eat pork, he doesn't do any of those things. He's a real un-American, right? 
Uh, no, I would say nowadays <laughs> no, it's I'm very just, American. I'm just teasing. You know, we're a consumerist uh, culture. We are a he's a consumer. He's a, uh, he's a thorough consumer. It's Tyson. Tyson? Does yeah. it sound good? Uh, Nike and Reebok have uh, a good customer <laughs> in Saeed. And you he can open his own sneaker store. <laughs> <laughs> Do the right thing. Okay, buddy, Be buddy. strong. And don't be wearing that silly hat. Serious. Yeah, no, there are definitely a lot of challenges raising a teenager uh, here in the West because there are a lot of uh, strong cultural influences, some of them uh, that I think most Muslims wouldn't see as being the healthiest thing. So you do your best. And you can't take it too seriously. You can't get obsessed with perfection. Perfection is for God. And that's, it's that simple. Which is stronger in American culture or faith? I think as uh, the American Muslim community itself becomes more integrated and more mature, faith would probably trump culture. And you have a new culture emerging. You have an American Muslim culture emerging, which is very important. Because then you can get a unique understanding of the religion that will allow the American Muslim to take his or her rightful place amongst the various Muslim communities of the world. How do you define that American Muslim community? What's its profile? Its profile is African American increasingly large numbers of uh, Latino Americans and European, Caucasian Americans, and immigrants, South Asians, Pakistanis, Arabs, and others. And collectively, I think you'll see a common American Islamic culture emerge. It's already happening. In his teaching, Shakir tries to help his fellow Muslims bridge the gap between the traditions of Islam and the realities of life in America. You can see the challenge he faces most clearly in the questions he gets over the role of women. Can you please clarify whether Allah says that the women are commanded to stay in the house? Uh, or should I quit my job? See, look at this. I mean, who's, who's teaching this sister Islam? Am I disobeying the commandment of Allah? Please clarify. It's a very controversial issue. Popular magazines and books often report on the harsh treatment inflicted on women in some Muslim countries. Does the Quran approve men beating their wives? Absolutely not. What about this scripture? Quote, and as for those women who, whose ill will you have reason to fear, admonish them, then leave them alone in bed, then beat them, and if thereupon they pay you heed, do not seek to harm them. Behold, God is indeed most high, great. I mean, that's clearly a rule written by men for men because it does give permission to be. No, that's not permission. There, if, if you take that verse out of any meaningful context, especially out of any exegetical context, and it, a, a person who would do that as a Muslim and use that to justify beating his wife, he would beat his wife anyway because he's a pathological lunatic, maniac. But some men have interpreted it differently. And what I'm saying, those men, that minority of men who would interpret it differently, they don't need that verse to justify beating their wives. That verse isn't in the Bible, and there are a lot of men in this society who beat their wives because they have certain pathologies and dysfunctions that will lead them to do that anyway. That's true, but it's one thing to do it with the sanction of... It, well, if anyone does it, they have no sanction from God or the Quran. While Shakir believes there are instances where the interpretation of Islam has been distorted, he's equally prepared to defend what he says are settled traditions. And I was frankly surprised. I mean, I know you've spent so many years becoming a scholar of the faith, but I was surprised that as American as you are, you yourself conclude that Islamic law does not permit women to lead prayer in a mixed congregation. That's the conclusion that I understand. Prayer leadership, that is part of religious ritual. And so there's certain rituals that have certain forms that the majority of scholars feel should be conducted in certain ways. But it seems to me logical to conclude that for Islam to become a, 
a, a truly dynamic religion in American culture, you are going to have to jettison in time the tether to those ancient traditions that grew up in a very paternalistic society a thousand years ago. Isn't that right? To, to, to become an American uh, religion in the context of our society with its declaration of independence and its women's movement and its drive toward equality, you're going to have to say we have to work out our own destiny here more closely to American dynamics than to a thousand years ago in the Middle East. I, I think the bigger challenge is to work all of that out uh, and, and more closely in line with our universal human values and beliefs. This, the, the important thing here is the truth. We are free to pursue the truth. And if our understanding of what we believe to be true is antithetical with a particular set of values or principles at a particular time and place, then that doesn't alter what we believe to be true. 100 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation because the values in American society wouldn't be conducive to us having this conversation. Well, the suffragettes were making this okay. case. But, they were. But they Could, were, but we They probably, were still hemmed in. They were tethered. They were barricaded from... But from, Muslim women aren't hemmed in, hemmed in, tethered, and barricaded. Here in this country, Muslim women <clears throat> are functioning at every level in this society. I, really, but, I, but, I, I want to send you the emails. We'll get to this conversation. Uh, the test isn't what the emails we get. I would say you should go out and talk to some Muslim women and ask them if they feel hemmed in and tethered. By, by their understanding of their religion. We met with some women at the Zaytuna Institute. They told us they are fully at home in the faith and in America. I think being an American and being a Muslim go hand in hand just like being a person of any faith and being an American. That's what this country was founded on, the freedom of religion. And I think that's why a lot of Muslims came here. That's why my family came here. With many Muslim countries and in, with, within different cultures, women are subjugated to a certain status and that they are for, some, th certain things are forced upon them in a few countries. But we have the same problems here in the United States in our own backyard. There is oppression of women. I mean, that is a global problem. Mm -hmm. Women are oppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it's fair to, to take a few stories and say, well, look, this is what the entire culture is like. You know, all the Muslim women in this country are treated like that, because that's not true. There are stereotypes on both ends, and there are fears on both ends. And, um, and the fears and the stereotypes are exactly the same. As, as an American Muslim, I feel like I'm an ambassador between um, the West and the Muslim world. You know, I, I walk into stores and, you know, people, people look at me. Go into a mall, People definitely turn their heads to, to look at me and look and see, you know, why, why is she wearing that? Or, you know, I get like, looks of question. I think what we have to really try to understand is that every culture has parameters for modesty. You know, I mean, we have a sense of modesty in this culture, and there's a different sense of modesty perhaps in France or, you know, or, or India. or every, every different place has different sense of parameters. And, but for Islam, what it does is it sets guidelines for what those parameters are. And that's really a very important thing to me as well in terms of being visibly Muslim is, is to sort of break down some of these stereotypes, even if it's one person at a time. We're all very much Americans. And, you know, we, we vote, we wake up in the morning and get ready for work just like every other American. And we're concerned about health care in America and we're concerned about mo the same things that most other Americans are concerned about. And I, I don't think that we do it in a less way than any other American does. They don't, they don't, they don't know you're a Muslim. So. Shakir reminds his young students that Islam is a vast and flexible faith. Different societies interpret it in different ways. So his constant refrain to them is, think for yourself. Some societies are more conservative. For example, Saudi society is very conservative, and probably too much so, because what it does, it breeds a lot of uh, inconsistencies and hypocrisies and dysfunctions in people. So we should really be cognizant of those things and not import other people's societal dysfunctions. We have enough of our own. <laughs> Don't abandon your common sense. Seriously. What do you tell these young people? 
when they're entrusting themselves to you, what do you tell them? Show people the full range of positive Islamic values. Don't limit yourself to this or that manifestation of Islam that might be truncated. Show the full range of values and people will appreciate that. How do you tell them to square those values with what they and we all see so often in the last few years of the imam calling for jihad or uh, uh, supporting the suicide bombers? How do you square those two uh, contrasting portraits of Islam in, with them? There's always going to be uh, radical uh, members in any community, and you're always going to have extremists. And, you know, for a long time, this sort of radical message had its appeal to me, myself. Uh, the but radical I, message from Islam? Uh, right. But I think, though, it's very important to see what extent that is real and to what extent it's exaggerated. So the radicals have always been there. A lot of the radicals being condemned today are the same radicals that were being praised in the 1980s. Not only by. praised, but lavishly financed by our government, by the CIA, by the American government. But then they the were Russians. banning the Russians in Afghanistan. Yeah. Well, I think that, again, the point I'm making, you have that, that element and it doesn't speak for the mainstream of Muslims. So when politics changes, that element then is transformed from a, a, a group of people who are serving our interests to a group of people who are antithetical to our interests. And the mainstream is always there, and they're being bypassed. So we're just saying... Interest will always change. But say, this does seem to me... Represent the mainstream. Uh, but this does seem to me a qualitative difference in extremism and radicalism. I mean, Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, James Dobson, all that crowd, they represent a different strain of my faith. But they are not calling for people to be beheaded. They're not well, calling for... But they're calling for people to be bombed into the Stone Age. So uh, what's, what's morally more repugnant five or six people being beheaded in some remote corner of the world, or Madeleine Albright admitting to children being starved and dying of disease because we bombed their sewage treatment plants and they have to drink sewage-infested water. What's more morally repugnant? I think we have to really look at things for what they are and get beyond the sensationalism of it all. This is what I'm saying. When it's in our interest to have this radical fringe destabilize the Soviet Union, it's fine when it's in our interest to have this radical fringe represent the whole of Islam and then present them as the most morally repugnant force on the earth. I think we have to get beyond the headlines, get beyond the sensationalism, and look at these as human problems that need to be addressed collectively because a lot of people are dying. And if you do a body count, we're killing a lot more of them than they're killing of us. But people are going to say, there, you see, is what we mean. You can never get a moderate Muslim to moderate, do what? To, to condemn, condemn the All radical. Right. I hope you. I hope you air this segment. Uh, I condemn all of the lunatics that are killing innocent people, be they in pizza houses in Tel Aviv, be they innocent. Muslims, Christians, or others being slaughtered senselessly in Iraq, as strongly as I condemn people getting into planes flying halfway around the world to bomb innocent people into uh, oblivion for no crime that those people have committed. I condemn all of it. Though he mostly steers himself away from politics in his talks these days, it's impossible for him to escape controversy altogether. Last year, the New York Times wrote a favorable profile of his leadership in the search for moderation. The article ended with Shakir indicating he hoped America would become a Muslim society, quote, not by violent means, but by persuasion. The head of the Anti-Defamation League said Shakir's views were un-American and hoped he was an aberration. An article in the Washington Times implied Shakir was a radical masquerading in moderate clothes. You kicked up a tempest with that remark. I mean, some people say you were arguing for America to become 
a theocracy ruled I, by I Islam. Wasn't, I wasn't arguing for anything. I was simply making a statement in the context of a, a very long interview that as a Muslim, I like to see everyone be a Muslim. And I, I, I would hope Christians would like to see everyone be a Christian. Well, there but are people who... I respect, I respect the right of people to be whatever they want to be and to disagree with that and to want people to be whatever they like to so see. So you weren't calling for a theocracy? I was not, absolutely not. I mean, and he, I, I would say further, I've never challenged the pluralistic basis of American society. Shakir tells his audiences that they will often be called on to defend their faith. In terms of manifesting Islam and letting people see its beauty in this society at a time when a lot of people are muddying it up. So we have this beautiful stream as crystal clear water, and we're looking at it and we're enthralled. Then someone runs over with a stick and stirs up all the mud on the bottom and say, look at it. <laughs> what? <Ugh. laughs> and it creeps. I wouldn't drink that if you paid me. So when there are a lot of people with sticks and they're muddying it up, we have to have, I'll do a lot of work to clear it out. You, you seem to be caught right in the middle. People afraid of Islam think you have an agenda of, for turning America into uh, a Muslim country. And the radicals in your own faith who consider themselves the pious think you are betraying your faith by moderation. Have you made peace with that conflict? Well, I think that a person has to pursue the truth as he or she understands it and then let the pieces fall where they may. If a person tries to adjust their values or principles or their positions based on what other people say, you're not going to have any positions that are your own because you're constantly trying to walk, walk this tightrope or balance between what pleases this person or that person and where, where will you end up? And then what is the possibility of creating an environment where people can begin to think about things a little differently? If I say, yes, you know, the radicals are right, takbir, Allahu Akbar, or jihad, then how are Muslims going to be challenged to, to look deeper at the realities of this world that rhetoric and sloganizing aren't going to do anything to change? Conversely, if in this country we say, yes, Muslims are bad, we're the worst thing since the bubonic plague, and if you're not careful, you're going to catch us and you're all going to be finished, then how do we create the climate that allows Americans to begin to deeply reflect on the realities of a, a, a defense budget in excess of $500 billion and the implications of all that for our foreign policy? How are we going to create some, a space where we begin, can begin to look at those issues more objectively if everyone either capitulates to this side or that side? Everything you say suggests that you do not feel your faith is incompatible with American democracy. I wouldn't be here. How so? Well, if I felt that my faith, and I'm a Muslim, a practicing Muslim, is incompatible with American democracy, why would I stay here? Because essentially I'd be saying, I cannot practice my faith here. That's not the question. That's not the case. You can see more from the Muslim women you've just met. Check out our web-exclusive video and join me on the blog at pbs.org. That's it for this week. Thanks for joining us on The Journal. I'm Bill Moyers.